Guild Wars 2's Condition Alacrity Spectre, an incredibly strong build that's come out since the new expansion. This build has seen a lot of play in high-end PvE content, Radiance, Fractals, but even on the open world, this build will serve you extremely well. Let's have a look at why this build is just so damn good. This build has got incredible DPS for a support build, but also has so much healing and support potential based into it, incredibly so, especially for a DPS support. This build is also quite good for new players to pick up. It's not the hardest build in the hardest rotation in the world, which makes it so attractive. Obviously, if you want to go in for harder PvE content, your Raiden and your Fractal CMs, yes, the rotation can be a bit quick, but if you're a newer player who doesn't mind giving up a little bit of rotation, you can just stay inside of your Shadow Shroud a little bit longer and make sure that you're comfortable with your Alak timing. So it's got a lot of flexibility in it, which is brilliant for newer players. This build also has so much CC. Thieves in general have an access to Basilisk Venom as well as an offhand pistol produces a lot of CC. Enough of the downside. The downside is to get optimal DPS, you're gonna have to get used to the rotation and it takes a little bit of time to get used to it, but once you've got the flow, you can definitely get towards a nice glossy rotation. Remember, if you are a newer player, don't stress about this. Lose a little bit of DPS. Make sure that you cap in a lack for the team, especially if there are split phases and things like this. Another downside is the way that you generate alacrity inside of Shroud doesn't allow you to see your utilities. This means that sometimes utility tracking kind of can be a slight issue. Good fight knowledge is kind of needed because if there is split phases coming or if there's CC on its way, you don't want to be going into Shroud and then not have access to either Alacrity or CC. So good fight knowledge is also kind of a con in a sense because for newer players, you might not know what's coming up next as well. And another major downside is you have two resources to manage. You've got Initiative, which is a normal thief resource, as well as your Shroud Force. This means that you have to try and balance the two. Use an initiative to do some big DPS and build up Shroud, as well as Shroud then to obviously generate your alacrity. This can kind of be quite tough on newer players, especially if you mismanage your Shroud. And the final negative is that your utilities are very reliant on if they are Venoms, either your friends attacking, which will basically spike your DPS, or if you are using Thousand Needles, that the boss or the ads do not move outside of the mark. Now before we get further into the guide, I am going to give you two different builds. They'll be linked in the description below. We got one, the normal build, which is better suited for your open world, your raided and your fractals. And then two, we're going to have a bit of a hybrid build with DPS and a lot of healing supports built into it. This build is also good for your open world or in some encounters like your raids and stuff where perhaps the healer is not coping with the heal pressure in certain fights. You can look at this by however it's a very niche build. Have a look and see which one you like. Build both if you want to. I hope you have a good one. Now let's have a look at some gear and stats. We do have two builds, so let's go through them quickly. Our first build, we're going to use all Richless gear. The reason why is this build with full Richless gear will get us to 42% boon duration. Yes, you can make this build run with a bit less boon duration, but for new players, 42% is great. We can always push this up by changing a few things like our sigils, our food, and our utilities, but 42% with good stacking should be plenty. For runes, we want Rune of the Trapper. The extra damage and condition duration is going to help us cap some important condies. Then for Relic, we want Relic of the Fractal. This is shown to be the highest DPS in Relic. However, if you want to play around with your build, you can have a look at things like Relic of Aristocracy and the Relic of Akeem. Or the Relic of Akeem, you won't have to play around with your build, but you will have to play around if you want Aristocracy to make sure that you're not over capping on condition duration. Some people like this relic because you do not require the new expansion to get it. So if you are one of those people that hasn't bought the new expansion yet and you want to make this build work, yes, you can use this relic and play around with your expertise to make sure that you're not over capping on your condition durations. Now for our weapons, what we are going to use, we're going to use a scepter in our main hand and dagger in our off hand. For sigils, you want superior sigil of demons and your superior sigil of doom. This is pretty much exactly how we'll play. Although it is almost a necessity, I would say non-negotiable 
to have a pistol in your offhand with your paralyzation sigil in for some big CC. However, if there is no CC in the fight, you can unequip it and put your dagger in the opposite gear set offhand. This means that we can weapon swap, but it still counts as swapping weapons for some of our traits later. Now let's have a look at the other option. This is the more supportive option. My gear isn't exactly the way it's supposed to be, so try ignore my stats a little bit. The idea behind this build is to go full Celestials with the Rune of Tormenting. What this will do is it will pump up a lot of other stats like our toughness, our precision power, healing power, etc. This will help us get to pretty much the same, if not more, boon duration. My weapons are still ritualist because I'm too lazy to change them. But this will also allow us to do a fairly decent job. Although we will use different food for this build. Again, you can have a look at the Relic of the Fractal as your most important one. If not, your Relic of Aristocracy and if not, the Relic of Akeem. And remember, again, Aristocracy, you will have to play around with your expertise. Maybe taking a few Plague Doctor pieces or something like this to try and drop down your expertise so that you're not overcapping on your condition duration. Again, you'll use the exact same weapons because these weapons are just too good not to take. Now for food and utilities, for the normal ritualist build one, the one for high-end radiant fractals, etc., we do want to have a look at the meaty asparagus skewers. What this will do is it will give us 15% torment duration as well as condition damage. This will help us cap our torment as well as a bit of extra condition damage, making this build absolutely pop off. However, if you are using the Celestial build, you'll notice that your Torment is capped. So then you will go for the bowl of Kimchi Tofu Stew. This gives you 15% Poison Duration and Condition Damage. This will help you cap your Poison. And for your Utilities, for DPS option, you want to look at the Magnanimous Tuning Crystals, taking advantage of all that Vitality and obviously you'll get some from your Toughness. However, if you are struggling to keep up your Alacrity Uptime, I highly recommend having a look at something like the Magnanimous Maintenance Oil. This will give you concentration instead of condition damage. This will help you obviously get some more boon duration and help you just make sure that you're capping alacrity. With that being said, another food option if you want to is the Plates of Egg Benedict. This will give you more concentration as well as expertise. So yes, you're not going to pop off as much DPS. But if you are struggling to keep up your lacquery uptime with your 42%, perhaps you've used the maintenance oil as well. You can always look at this as just another option for more concentration. Now let's go through our traits and specializations. Your first specialization, Deadly Arts. Minor trait 1, Serpent's Touch. Stealing inflicts poison and as well your down skills inflict poison. Poison damage is a massive source of our overall damage because remember poison and torment are our two capped condition duration skills. Now in column one for most purposes we'll use deadly ambition. What this does is put poison on your dual wield skill i.e. your skill three. That can be quite good for our DPS overall as well as 180 base condition. So just allowing all our skills to hit even harder. Now if you are on open world or you do struggle a little bit with some of the damage in certain encounters, Mug is not terrible. What this does is put a heal as well as some minor damage on our steel skill, which is our F1 ability. Yeah, if you're out in open world, this is just a way to get some healing, especially the fact that we're going to produce alacrity on ourselves even while out in open world, will mean that we can use this skill quite often, and that's quite good for consistent healing. Minor trait 2, Lotus Poison. When we poison a target, we're producing weakness. Yes, this is on a 10 second cooldown, but we're going to be poisoning targets continuously all the time. So without even realizing this is going to be on for a duration, and what's nice about this is, is when CC bars come, we're going to have this extra soft CC that might just be on, helping us CC. And in column two, we're going to look at Panic Strike. What this does is when immobilizing a foe, we poison them as well. When we strike, i.e. hit foes below 50% health, we cause immobilization. Now, this is on a 20 second cooldown, so it is quite a fairly long skill to wait for. But because of certain utilities, as well as obviously towards the tail end of the fight, immobilization is going to just happen naturally. 
the poison damage is going to be pretty good. However, if you are struggling, uh, say on open world for some reason, even the odds for a bit of vulnerability and might, not the worst thing in the world, Minor Trade 3 Exposed Weakness. What this does is we gain 2% damage for every unique condition on the target. This will obviously mean that in open world encounters where there are a lot of people attacking a boss and there's pretty much just every condition damage under the sun on the boss, we're going to be doing a ton of DPS. However, in certain cases, maybe certain fractal fights, where maybe we're just focusing on a couple of condies, your damage will drop a little bit. But overall, just a nice thing to know about. And in column three, there's only one real option, potent poison. Increasing the poison damage, increasing its duration, and also allowing for an additional stack on every application. That is why you'll notice that all these poison effects are in blue, because there is an additional poison stack from this trait. Specialization number two, Trickery. Minor trait one, Kleptomaniac. Gaining initiative when stealing. Notice that's our F1 skill. Now in column one, we do have two pretty good options. Most of the time, people like to take Thrill of the Crime. What this does is when you use your F1, your Siphon, i.e. your Steal ability, you'll produce Fury, five stacks of might and swiftness, and you'll maintain that on your party. This is affected by our boon duration, so you'll notice that it's not 10 seconds, however more. And because of the alacrity, our siphon ability will reduce, meaning we can maintain the fury, the might and the swiftness permanently. This helps your healer or your other support not have to cover these boons and also makes it incredibly strong on the open world to have these boons permanently on. However, another interesting option actually is lesser caltrops. Now, this is not really considered a good trait to take most of the time because it's quite a lot to give up. However, if you do need a source of bleed for your Relic of the Fractal, this could be an option that you could take if you don't want to play around with your other traits. Having this option will obviously proc your Relic of the Fractal and therefore help you with some big DPS. When dodging, you leave behind these Caltrops that do bleeding and cripple, which is obviously a soft CC. Minor trait 2, Preparedness. Increase your maximum initiative by 3, as well as gaining expertise. Just a really good minor trait in general, and just nice to know about helping you cap your condition durations. Now in column 2, again, two good options. Most of the time people tend towards Bountiful Theft. What this does is you steal 3 boons from a target, i.e. boon rip, but not just ripping boons, but giving them to your party. So this is incredibly strong in certain fights like Doom, where basically he just gets a ton of boons, you can rip them off and make sure that everybody's boon up time is looking pretty good. But even if there are no boons, providing vigor for your party with quite a high duration makes this an incredibly strong skill to have. Because remember, just like with our first column choice, we'll be able to maintain this vigor up permanently. This benefits some classes like Mirage and Vindicator and a lot of other classes extremely well, especially in some groups. Having more vigor means you can dodge more often, which means that people take less damage, which is just a great thing to have all around. The other option is pressure striking. What this skill does is it allows you to give torment when interrupting a foe. This can be quite good, especially in fractals, because there is a lot of interrupting to be done. However, if there are still boons in fractals, you do need to still look at Bountiful Theft if there is no one else to strip boons. But pressure in strikes especially torment damage is going to be big dps so this is an incredibly strong skill especially in fights where you need to interrupt fairly often but just take a note of the text below remember defiant enemies can only gain this effect once every three seconds minor trade three lead attacks and this is a deceptively good trait to know about basically when we spend initiative we're going to be gaining a buff called lead attacks this is a 10 second cooldown we can tear this up all the way to 15 stacks. What this means is we'll be doing plus 15% damage, condition damage, and lifesteal damage. This is incredibly strong. Now in column three, we have again two options that are fairly good. Most of the time you'll look at quick pockets. We gain initiative when swapping weapons and obviously while in combat on an eight second cooldown. Very important to note, three initiative, that's quite a decent gain. Notice that going inside of your Shadow Shroud counts as a weapon swap. So going in and out will proc this. However, obviously there is the 8 second cooldown. This is also good because when we swap out of our Scepter Dagger to perhaps our Scepter Pistol, 
we'll have a little bit of extra initiative for our headshots so we can CC. Now, Deadly Ambush is a fairly interesting option to look at. Stealing applies bleeding and the bleeding you inflict deals more damage, i.e. we're going to get three stacks of bleed and it's going to be 25% better. However, we don't really produce any bleeding in our bolt except for 1000 needles. Now, obviously, we need bleeding to proc our Relic of the Fractal. So, if we do not look at something like the Lesser Caltrops, we do need to produce bleeding if we are not taking Thousand Needles for some instance. So, this is pretty much a good option. However, if you are looking at something like a Relic of Akim or some other Relic, we can obviously look at not taking this, but staying with Quick Pockets. But if we do need a bleed effect, this is usually where we will look for a bleed effect before we look at lesser caltrops. Now for our lead specialization, a Spectre. Minor trait 1, the skill Spectre, unlocks Scepter. Wow, mouthful. Uh, our steel becomes our siphon and will basically gain Shadow Shroud when we spend initiative. We also then get reduced initiative by 3. But because of preparedness, this means that it will pretty much be your normal initiative. It also gives our access that our steel becomes a siphon. Now we have loaded up siphon with amazing things like possible boon steel, poison, boons, as well as extra initiative. So our F1 skill is quite big in terms of our rotation and we can't really delay it by too much. So you can almost in your brain think, I need to use it pretty much off of cooldown, but there is obviously a part of the rotation that it needs to fit into to really get some maximum effect. Now in column one, a second opinion is pretty much the way most people go. What this does is gives us healing power based on our condition damage, and this helps you just support the healer a little bit more, especially with your heal skill. And remember, if you are running the Celestial build, this makes your healing power quite strong and you can actually do a fair bit of extra support and healing. As well, base condition damage and additional condition damage when you have a scepter, which we do have. So we're getting quite a lot of utility from this trait. However, if you do need extra support, there is this really neat trait, Consume Shadows. What this does is when you're inside of Shadow Shroud, it will give you stacks of Consume Shadow. You can have a maximum of five stacks and your whole party will benefit from this. What this does is it will give you a heal of 10% per stack. So that means you can have up to a 50% heal when releasing the skill. It will consume the rest of your Shadow Shroud. So that is a bit of a sad payoff, but it will heal the team for the amount of stacks you've accrued. But if you overheal someone, perhaps they only had 10% damage and now you've healed them by 50% from your healing stacks, the difference, i.e. the 40% overheal, will just convert into barrier. And that can be pretty massive for a lot of fights. You know, if you think of your Veil Guardians and things like that, if the healer's really struggling, you can preempt the greens and that way that just helps the healer not have to cope with so much healing. So yeah, an incredible supportive skill, although you are going to trade off an absolute ton of damage. As well, you'll spend all of your Shadow Shroud using the skill. That means you will struggle to keep up your alacrity because you're not going to be able to generate a lot of Shadow Shroud. But there is another trait that we'll look at in a second that will help you when taking this trait. A minor trait to Dark Sentry. When you apply barrier to your allies, you basically give them a buff called Rottweiler Venom. This lasts 10 seconds and allows them to inflict torment. The torment is attributed to you DPS wise, as well it is from your stats. So they can hit fairly decent. And also this will also increase our outgoing healing by 20%. So this just allows us to do some big support. So if you have the ability to produce barrier to allies and it doesn't really cost you anything DPS wise. Or perhaps you just like to play more supportingly. This effect is fairly decent and it's on a 1 second cooldown. So it's incredibly strong. And in column 2 we have two very good options. Obviously for your normal DPS support option you're going to go for Lost in this Torment. What this does is it gives us lifesteal on torment damage, which is extremely strong, as well as extra shadow force, i.e. so we can start building up to go for a shadow shroud. Notice that there is red text saying that you will not gain this effect when inside of your shadow shroud. So all your torment inside there, not as good. But we will be spending quite a lot of skills that will do a lot of torment outside of that. And this is just good. Good survivability, giving us that healing option, 
as well as the option to get more Shadow Shroud and to carry on doing some big DPS as well as Alacrity uptime. And the other option is Traversing Dusk. What this allows you to do is when you use a Shadow Step ability, so one of these wells, your Shadow Step to an area, and we'll go more into that in Utilities, they'll give you 5% baseline Shadow Force as well as 1% per an ally that's affected. So this can be incredibly good for trying to get your Shadow Force up, especially if you are taking the trade Consuming Shadows. Because remember, this caches out all the remaining Shadow Force when leaving. So taking this trait allows you to get quite a lot of Shadow Force, especially if you are going to bring a whole bunch of wells so that you can maintain this. It also produces a smallish heal, which is fairly good for some passive healing as well as resistance. So this can be quite good for a very supportive trait. Minor trait 3, Panicus Ambition. What this does is it gives you barrier if you strike with a stealth attack. As well, if you apply stealth to allies, they gain barriers. So just a good trait to be aware of, especially if you can somehow combo it with obviously a dark sentry. Now in column 3, obviously we're taking Shade Step. This is the skill, the trait that allows us to produce alacrity when inside of Shadow Shroud, our skills produce alacrity. But notice that the alacrity is produced around the tethered ally. This is important to know because we need to be very specific is to who we tether to and we'll get into that in the rotation concept now if you are playing the pure dps build just switching obviously to strength of shadows changes this build from an alike build to a pure dps head build so obviously you'll need vipers gear and a bit of a different setup but notice that it's literally just that trade change and we're pretty much from a dps to an alike giver and now let's have a look at some of the awesome utilities. For healing skills, we're spoiled for choice. Well of Gloom is pretty good. This is generally what most people take because it allows you to obviously reposition quite easy as well as do some decent AoE healing. Also, 20 second cooldown, not really hurting it. The fact that it's so short, making it a very strong option. However, if you do want stealth, obviously hiding shadows, extremely strong withdraw not the worst especially because of the evade frame but i like me some skulk venom a strong heal as well as some good party healing being able to put this on pre-cost and allow your party just to get some big healing out of it is just such a strong heal overall however if you want the lazy man's option the signet of malice obviously also really strong just passively will heal you when you attack as well active you'll gain a fairly decent heal let me just take a second of your time to explain Venom to some of our players that have never played Thief or maybe just don't understand it. Things like your Skulk Venom or your Spider Venom or your Scale Venom, things like this have a number of charges. You can see that it's either 4 or 6 or 5 charges etc. And when you apply them, they'll go on you for the 24 seconds. Now, these also apply to your entire party. You'll notice that the maximum number of targets is 5. This means that everybody in your party will get this Venom on them. This means that you will get a massive spike of DPS because remember, Venoms apply from your stats and all the damage is attributable to you, especially in the combat analysis. So using these skills when your team is stacked up nicely so that everybody gets it and making sure that they all attack in that 24 seconds, especially that healer, don't let him not stand there and just not attack. This will help you spike some big DPS. So you're getting the effect of each of these Venoms per a charge per a party member. So if all of the people attack six times, you'll get six stacks of poison times the five people. So you'll get 30 stacks of poison on the target and all that damage is attributable to you, which can create some massive spike DPS. Yes, these have fairly long cooldowns, but that's why Spider Venom and scale venom on almost non-negotiables that torment damage and that poison damage are extremely high and you'll use these off cooldown and another important thing to know about the venom skills is that they are instant costs so they won't interrupt anything if you're in the middle of some other skill costs you can put these on and they'll just go on instantly and now for an incredibly important utility thousand needles this has two parts to it and I'll try to explain the skill as best as possible. 
When we use the skill prepare thousand needles, we'll have a half a second charge time. Do not interrupt this as it will put it on cooldown. Once it has charged and armed, the skill will be ready to use. Now it doesn't matter where I am when I activate thousand needles, it will appear on the mark. This means that you need to know the fight or try and position a boss back in the thousand needles to try and take advantage. Especially if you're playing the celestial build and you are the tank yourself, you need to try be aware to make sure the skill hits. Now, why is this skill so important? Firstly, it is an immobilization, so we can make use of Panic Strike to try get some poison damage from this. Also, it is our only source of bleed unless we have changed our traits, meaning that we need this to prac Relic of Fractal. So this skill will proc not just some extra poison damage, but also our Relic of Fractal, as well as produce some poison and bleed it by itself, as well as Cripple, which is some soft CC, included with immobilization which is more soft cc so this skill is an absolute dragon pot of awesomeness but it is sometimes quite hard to hit in some cases or some fights where the target moves a lot when activated it will pelt the ground and obviously produce some massive effects we need to try and use the skill pretty much off of cooldown to make sure that we're getting that relic of fractal damage now obviously if you're struggling with thousand needles or perhaps the fights do require you can switch out for other utilities but remember you will lose the bleed effect and that's our only bleed effect so either a you need to switch around some traits to look for some other source of bleed or you need to switch a relic because you can't do without not having some sort of dps boost from the relic so a couple of other options we can have a look at is something like Devourer Venom. This allows you to get a mobilization, which will obviously allow us to still get some of the benefits from Panic Strike. This will allow us to get a mobilization, some soft CC, and yeah, fairly decent option. Another option if your team is struggling for boons is Well of Bounty, especially if you are playing more of a supportive build. Perhaps you are taking some of the other traits like your Traversing Dusk, this will just be another good skill. Another 8 stacks of Might, Stability, Fury, Regen and Vigor. Extremely strong. And you can obviously have a look at a couple of other wells. If you do want some of that extra healing as well as Shadow Force, play around with it and see what works for you depending on the role that you're playing in your open world or even your raid group. Now another good utility, Scorpion Wire, this is obviously some small CC but it's quite useful in fractals especially if you have multiple targets because it does have two charges making it fairly useful. Now the Thief is blessed with quite a lot of good utility options but another one to be aware of is Shadow Portal. This is often taken in raid encounters for certain skips like Kadeem 1. You might be in charge of porting people over to the Pyres, things like this. And yeah, just important to be aware of a lot of these utilities. And other than that, just playing around with them is also fairly fun. And off our elite utility, we've pretty much got only a few options. Basculus Venom is generally what we leave on because it is just incredibly strong CC ability. It does 150 defines break bar, i.e. CC, and obviously we're given that to five targets, so that can equate to about 750 CC if everybody hits it. So hopefully people aren't wasting it on a random ad, but on the thing that actually needs to be CC'd. Shadowfall, the well ability, is a fairly interesting option. It appears to be a better AoE defines break bar option, but it has a much larger cooldown than Basilisk Venom. But if you are taking traits like Traversing Dusk and you do want to gain from some of those well ability, the Shadow Steps, this could be something that you can look at as a decent option. However, if no CC is required in the fight, Thieves Guild is pretty much the way most people go because this would just allow you to gain a little bit more DPS. Even in Fractals, a lot of times people will precast Thieves Guild, then switch to Basilis and take the Mistlock to make sure that they have it ready for the fight. And that equates to a little bit of extra DPS. And now for the tougher part of the guide, the rotation concept and just basically the gameplay concept in general. We're going to combine in weapon skills in here, so I'm going to try to explain it all in one go. Before combat starts, you should use a siphon to target on an ally that you want to tether to. 
usually you want to select the tank or possibly maybe a healer or someone that's not designated to go out and do a mechanic. Now obviously in some fights there might be things that you can't control, like in Doom there might be someone who has to go and drop off a bomb. Obviously don't select someone who's going to go do a green because that's just silly. Once you've used your F1 skill on someone, they will be your targeted ally for the remainder of the fight or if you move outside of the 1200 range. That means that it will always select them when you go into Shadow Shroud as your targeted ally. That means that all effects, all the positive effects excluding your lack will be placed from them. Now it doesn't matter if they're not in your subgroup, you will still gain the effects but it will pulse via them. This is important to also to be aware of in fights like Zera where there could be a group that's sent away. Now if you do not pre-do this it is fine but when you use Shadow Shroud it's going to pick a random person. Now that person might get mechanics or be away from the group. It will pick a random person in the 1200 range. So you want to try and control the odds as much as possible by pre-selecting it. Now if you are just doing normal PV content, raids, fractals and the like, you're not going to use this as a support team but as an offensive skill. So you'll use it after you've selected your ally to just apply the poison, the boon steel, as well as gain some shadow force. This is gonna help you maintain your rotation due to that and also the initiative. Now, every fight will differ slightly, but if I can try and paint you a little picture. As a support alacrity DPS, our main objective is to try and give us some alacrity as quickly as possible. If you're starting further away from the boss, at minimum, what, especially when grouped up, you only use Venoms when grouped because you want to try and get as much DPS. But if you are running towards the boss with your party, you want to use both Venoms, perhaps try get a couple of Twilight combos as you're running towards the boss, use your Siphon skill, this will give you quite a lot of Shadow Force, and then go into your Shadow Shroud. Now inside of Shroud we have access to a lot of skills. If you are playing more just for DPS support, you want to prioritize a skill 2, Grasping Shadows, into skill 4, the Eternal Knight, and then Auto Attack, get off one more Grasping Shadow and exit Shroud. Now if you are uncomfortable with that lack of uptiming, you can stay a little bit longer. Obviously the more glossy and fluid your rotation is, the higher your DPS will be. But if you do struggle with alacrity uptiming, or perhaps you want to use a few other skills, you're more than welcome to. Remember, the more extreme you want to be at your rotation, obviously the higher your DPS. But as a newer player, don't be scared to throw in something like Dawn's Response. Yes, it isn't a very big hidden skill, but the barrier as well as the fear could be fairly good in some situations. Notice also that Mind Shock is a slight and defined break bar, but also three stacks of stability. This can be quite clutch in a lot of fights where stability is needed, especially in some fractals. If your other heal support or your other support is not provided enough stability in crucial moments, you can obviously provide this when inside of Shadow Shroud. And also your auto attack, your horn shot is a fairly decent hitting skill. The torment is going to be quite a lot of DPS. So if you are a newer player or perhaps you're anticipating a split phase or something, staying inside of Shadow Shroud a little bit longer and using a few more skills will just build up your alacrity reserves so that it gives you more flexibility later on in your rotation. Now once you've given alacrity, your idea is to just basically spam Twilight Combo. This is pretty much where all of our DPS is going to come from. Big Poison, Big Torment, as well as some Chill, but this takes four initiatives. So we're going to spam this for a bit. Once we've hit Twilight Combo at least once, we'll use our F1 skill. This will obviously do some effects. If you do need to strip boons, you will hold off. But the reason why we want to try use it once we've used Twilight Combo once is we want to get that two initiative so that we can try spam Twilight Combo as much as possible. Then you will auto attack just off of cooldown. So you're basically going to use all your initiative on Twilight Combo and then auto attack. What this will do is it will allow us to build up some Shadow Force as well as passively wait for our initiative to come back. You'll spam Twilight Combo and auto attacks until your Shadow Shroud is ready. And then you'll go back into your Shadow Shroud 
and do your rotation whether you want to camp a little bit longer to make sure that alacrity is capped up and play more supportive or do the bare minimum and get out it doesn't matter it's all about your experience level and what's going to work for your group now if you are struggling for might you can use shadow sap obviously this is not something you want to be using too much as it's a massive dps loss but the extra might will help your group sometimes in fractals the other support might not be producing enough might and even though we are helping with some other skills like thrill of crime this can be used to just try cap up the might especially if you are playing a more celestial supportive build now obviously if the dagger skills are fairly decent we got some torment and cripple i.e soft cc on dagger 4 and dagger 5 has got some stealth and vulnerability generally we won't really touch these two skills but when we weapon swap we have access to headshot this is a massive cc and ability but obviously we're going to need quite a fair bit of initiative to try get a few of these shots off what's nice about thief in general is there's no real cooldown you can just spam and as long as there's initiative you can get off as many of these headshots as you want to this can do quite a lot of cc especially because we have the paralyzation sigil traded in the pistol will help us do big breakboard damage just be aware that now while you have your pistol out your skill three will be your measured shot and so obviously you're going to want to use more auto attacks at this part of your rotation and switch back to your dagger now with all that being said obviously you're going to want to use your venoms off of cooldown obviously not basilisk and you want to going to use a thousand needles pretty much off of cooldown good fight knowledge is key here trying to make sure that this is always where the boss is going to be or the ads are going to be to try and make sure that you get in that bleed you want to proc your relic of the fractal but obviously there's some fights where this is just so hard to predict when you're doing fights like solus horror or even fractal 100 the bosses tend to move quite a lot so trying to predict where to place this can be fairly tough that is why in some fights you might have to play around with your traits to make sure that either you're taking a different relic or that you're getting bleed from another source and use another utility if that is the case however trying to make sure that all three of these utilities are used off of cooldown is absolutely massive for dps and that's it that's pretty much it if i can put it in a nutshell we're spamming skill three a couple of auto attacks going into shadow shroud hidden two for a few auto attacks to and out if you want to use a couple more skills do it try and make sure that you're comfortable with your owner lack up time get in out again making sure that we're using f1 almost off of cooldown but not at full initiative because we want to try gain from that extra two initiative and then obviously spam twilight combo if we do see some cc come in switch to your pistol nice and early try build up a little bit of initiative so that we can spam some headshot pre-cast basilisk venom because remember there is a cast timer to basilisk which is different from the other venoms that are instant cast making sure to always try and use thousand needles off of cooldown try pre-predict where the boss is going to be and try use the skill to get those bleed stacks and make sure that you're doing some big dps obviously switching back to your scepter dagger as quickly as possible and then trying to spam some more skill three and that's it this class is so fun like i said this is so easy for new players but obviously the better you get at the class the quicker and sharper your timing can be and there's so much safety net as well playing around with your food utilities as well as sigils you can increase your boon duration to such a degree that you don't have to stress about your lack up time and then just focus on the rotation get used to the feeling of it and then obviously just enjoy the class make it your own Thank you so much for watching guys i really hope you've enjoyed the guide i've enjoyed making it i've been playing this class so much in fractals open world at the moment i'm trying to read a little bit more on it and yeah i'm just absolutely loving it i don't make these guides because i'm trying to just churn out some sort of video i really make a guide because i've personally enjoyed playing a class and i'm like damn this is actually really cool and every single guide i make is because I wish when I started Guild Wars that there were more videos that just kind of went a little bit deeper in depth because I really want to understand. I don't want to just see a rotation and be like, okay, two, four, two, 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 what? It, it doesn't work for me. And maybe it doesn't work for you. And maybe that's why you enjoy my guides. And thank you. Thank you so much for supporting, watching, giving likes, sharing, things like that. 
I know there's some other guys that are a bit more elitist and kind of just thinking that, you know, we need to be like pushing out like maximum bench, pushing people towards the hardcore stuff. But for me, you know, as long as you're having fun in Guild Wars, playing the game, finding classes you love playing and yeah, hopefully my guides can explain them a little bit better, then I'm stoked. <laughs> Anyway, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please like, subscribe, all the cool things. If you didn't like it, um, thank you so much for watching anyway. And yeah, hopefully I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers.